Welcome to Popcast Deluxe. You're bringing the Rick Boots back to South Carolina of your weekly cultural review. I am John Caramonica. I'm Joe Coscarelli. So a lot has happened since we were last live in the chairs. Um, we're going to talk about celebrity misbehavior, particularly pop star misbehavior, what we let people get away with, how people's public narratives intersect with the way they are received when they don't do something that is neatly morally clean. So we're going to talk about Lizzo. I was going to say that was a lot of words to, to say <laughs> Lizzo. Lizzo. Uh, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about the Cardi B situation. We've talked about people throwing things on a prior episode, but uh, the back and forth with the Cardi situation recently sort of li- ties into this. Uh, Travis Scott album is out. Utopia. Mm. Mm. As, w- as we record, he is performing live in Rome. Live in Rome. Circus Maximus. It's funny because he was originally supposed to perform at the pyramids. Yes, in Egypt. But then everyone was like, "Not in Vegas." It's called Circus Maximus. <laughs> that's that's in Rome, that's bro. Rome. <laughs> hey, bro, that's in Rome. And then he was like, "Oh yeah, never mind. Like, scratch the Egypt thing. Like, we'll do Rome." It's cool. It's very. They're very close yeah. to each other. Yeah. Um, in, in the history books. <laughs> yes, it's like, true. In period, in periodicity, they're they're very close. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Sinead O'Connor. And Angus Cloud, um, uh, both of whom passed away in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we got question. We got songs. We got snacks. We got Obamacare. We got a lot going on. Um, one thing I do want to say: we are now up to three confirmed Popcast T-shirt sightings at major tours. We have the Eras Tour. We have the Renaissance Tour, so Taylor and Beyonce. We have the Glaive Tour. The Glaive Tour. Also a major summer tour. Yeah. Um, there are only a few shirts left. I only have smalls and a couple XLs. So it's the popcast.myshopify.com. Wear it to a show. Wear it to a show. Get spotted by a fellow Popcast listener. And, and, and have a photo. Tag us or have somebody else drop us an email or mention in the Discord because that's how we're hearing about stuff. So anyway, uh, Popcast shirts available before whatever we do next, which we'll do something. We'll figure it out. Um, Joe, so we've been away. And I, I'll be honest, like one of the things about being off for a week is when something happens – There was some small part of me that was like, maybe we don't have to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can let this go. But the Lizzo situation seems to not be going away. It's mutating. Uh, Additional characters are showing up. People's ex-partners are showing up. Um, It's being memed to death, basically. Relentlessly. Yeah. Can you give us a pricey of what happened. Is that a legal term? (laughs) Yes. Can you give us a pricey of what happened with the Lizzo situation? Lizzo was sued along with her touring company and her lead choreographer. Choreographer, yeah. uh, By three former backup dancers for discrimination and sexual harassment. Uh, The details are pretty colorful. Mm -hmm. They're all, you know... Just allegations, yeah, allegations at this point. We don't know. And they're not criminal allegations. They're civil allegations. Right. This is a, a, a lawsuit in California. Uh, Lizzo is being accused of fostering a overly clubby, overly comfortable, overly sexualized yes. work, work atmosphere. environment. Yes. Uh you know, the details With really both of those things kind of in quotes, because it's kind of where does work stop and socializing begin, especially in settings like this, yeah. which are not nine to five jobs. Yes. And I think the reason it's sticking as a pop culture story and the reason we want to talk about it is because regardless of what's going to happen in court, like regardless of whether or not this is going to go to a trial and Lizzo is going to be found to be a toxic boss, like truly the least relevant, right? That's all least sort of likely to be relevant. That's all but. beside the point. What, what happened is people are clinging to it because it either confirms or it undermines ideas that people already had about Lizzo, whose yes. fame is as much about her persona as it is about her music. When I was a little girl, all I wanted to see was me in the media. Someone fat like me, black like me, beautiful like me. <laughs> so positivity is sort of Lizzo's metier. Empowerment. And so 
a lot of the discourse, critical discourse, and also popular discourse about Lizzo over the years has not, strictly speaking, been about the quality of her music. It's been about message, and it's been about um, to what degree is what she's offering different from what other pop stars are offering? How does it expand the narrative? Um, and I think for a lot of people, Lizzo's relationship to empowerment, positivity. Um, Body it, positivity specifically. Yeah, and is a different kind of spirit from a lot of other contemporary pop stars. And so there are, I think, a lot of fans who put a lot of faith that Lizzo walked the walk. And not only talked the talk, but also walked the walk. So I think there is a, a, a sort of... Um, a group of listeners and enthusiasts for whom I'm coming to understand, like let's, these are allegations, but the suggestion that they might be true is in essence a complete disruption of the entire Lizzo fantasy. Right, the brand yes. and the, the sell. And Lizzo's brand, from what I can tell online by how this is being treated, is not able to withstand this kind of like blowing on the house of cards. Right. And I think what we're really learning is that the Lizzo fantasy, if it was a fantasy, was a fragile one. Yes. In part, I think, because there's not that much music backing it up. You know, Lizzo has a handful of medium-sized hits. Yeah. And sure. one really big song, hey, Truth Hurts. Yeah, I was going to say, one huge hit. One huge hit, a bunch of songs that some people like, and like a celebrity essence and tour business. And I think the other thing you're seeing here, which I think we see with a lot of pop stars, is that there's also the silent component of people just sitting around waiting and being really annoyed by somebody's public persona. And then latching I mean, on the minute something goes the wrong. minute there's anything to sink, sink your teeth into. And the fact that this suit has Lizzo, queen of body positivity, in fact, being a tyrant behind the scenes and saying, allegedly, you're too fat to be my dancer is the ultimate hypocrisy. Of course. And there's nothing that people love more than to take people that they thought were flimsy messengers in the first place and do a gotcha. It's also an interesting commentary on the fickle nature of contemporary fandom outside of what I would think of as classic stands. Like, let's say hypothetically this had happened to a Rihanna, a Taylor, a Beyonce. Stands would ride. Stands would absolutely tear the accusers apart. Like, this is... but. Lizzo exists in a slightly different space. I don't know what the intensity of the Stan army was prior to this, but I don't think it was nearly the strength of kind of what we think of as the classic high test Stan armies. And I think what that says is all that stuff that feels like it's actually bolstering you and supporting you, if you're not reading the room correctly, if it really is made of cardboard and dust, it can go away like that. And actually suggest that what people were into with Lizzo was the idea of Lizzo, not the actuality of Lizzo. Right. And Lizzo has had to come out and, of course, deny all of this and say, you know. They're like unbelievable. Yeah, allegations. that this is so hurtful to her. Uh, you know, then meanwhile, the, so the accusers are going on TMZ live and sort of like pleading their case, which is, again, sort of like a a – a gesture to the court of public opinion, not to an actual court in but Los Angeles. But the actual court is simply the uh, fulcrum on which the court of public opinion starts to play out, right? Because ultimately, Lizzo will be carrying these allegations, even if she's 100% cleared. They will be talking about this in Lizzo interviews five years from now, ten years from now. That's how it feels. And even interview-wise, like, that to me is secondary to, like, the jokes. Like, the cruelness of the jokes mm -hmm. that have already come mm -hmm. even in the first wave of this like we haven't even gotten to like legal discovery like if this goes to trial then we're going to be seeing yeah. text messages and emails and you no know. way it's going to trial <laughs> there's no way it's Sorry, going to no trial. Go. but going to trial. you know a, a, 
allow me to, no to way fantasize that, as sure, a reporter. I'm just saying there's yeah. no way that at some date in 2025 you will be sitting upstairs waiting for the Liz over to go around. <laughs> like that's not gonna happen. But in the meantime, you know, you've you've gotten, you know, I I mean like I don't even know if I could say this, but like the trending topic was our belly, which is like, like again, like this is like people went in on this. The, the, the memes, I mean, do it, do a dive yourself. Like mm-hmm. I, they're not safe for this platform, for this, no, not safe. For uh, but like, but it, it, it indicates that people, there was a level of vitriol just below the surface. Do you think that there's a different, cause like I'm looking at like the Lizzo hits, right? And there are actually maybe there's more than one huge hit. There's about damn time. Oh yeah. Huge okay. Hit. Okay. Fine. Um, Unfortunately. Good as hell. It's like a pretty big hit. Sure. Um, so we're short changing Lizzo as a pop star. But do you think that there's two categories of Lizzo fans? Like a lot of these songs are, forgive me, they're Starbucks records. They are um, CVS CBS songs. records. Yeah. They're Z100 records. They're records that sound like pop records of earlier eras to the point where you can embrace the sound and the style without necessarily yeah, worrying no, too much about Yeah, no, they're for casuals. Yeah, yeah, without necessarily worrying too much about who's doing the performing. Uh, I also think there's probably like an age gap where maybe like older audiences who are not as plugged in online sort of say, oh, Lizzo, a contemporary pop star who makes music that sounds kind of like music that I grew up with at some point in my life. Whereas young fans, maybe Lizzo was already, as you suggest, a more complicated figure, but by and large had never come in for a reckoning. But that fan group is much more fickle and much more online. I think we're seeing this also in other parts of popular culture where – this sort of moment of like middle of the last Obama administration through the Trump administration Mm -hmm. where corporations sort of subsumed anything positive going on, representational Mm -hmm. politics, this sort of thing, you know, this like it's good that this exists for the world type art. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think there's been a little bit of a backlash. Yeah. Backlash to that sort of fomenting, for a long time and Lizzo to many people, you know, you can read some of the negative reviews that Lizzo has gotten over the last few years, uh, which really lash out at that aspect Mm -hmm. of her, that, that it always feels like you're being sold soap or Mm -hmm. razors, uh, when you listen to a Lizzo album. Mm -hmm. And I think this moment now is the one where it is safe to say, in fact, all of that was crap and let's, I can't believe we had to pretend like this was good. And I think that there's, you were seeing right. that so in, it's not in simply film a, and television and right. music and celebrity. And right. And not simply a commentary on Lizzo, right. Lizzo's music or Lizzo's success. Right. But like we have come through the fire of being forced to think a certain way. And now there's a sense of like, I can be released from that. And it's only convenient that the Lizzo bubble is being burst at the same time. Right. I think it's cumulative. It's yeah. like it's a quote unquote cancellation, but not for the claims in this individual lawsuit, but for what people feel like they've had to shoulder and what they've had to take silently from the people telling us, beating you over the head with the idea that Lizzo was important. Can I do like a brief sidebar on Lizzo's music? <laughs> what do you think of Lizzo's music, John? I think the more recent music is better than the older music crazy but fine yeah like i admit i freely admit these are unpopular takes they're not shared by a lot of sure. people um i think the thing that was part of the lizzo narrative all the way going back to the very beginning was here's lizzo who's a uh, a deeply music a deeply musical technician mm-hmm. or a deeply technician oriented musician right which is the flute um you know, is someone who is extremely schooled in the creating of music. And also toiled underground independently for a, a decade. A long time. Yeah. Uh, someone, you know, someone who could have been like a Berkeley College of Music type. The flute thing. Yeah, like someone who kind of coming from that perspective. Um, and I do think when Lizzo was having the breakout moment, not to be like, oh, sacrificed all the stuff that like made her underground yeah, stuff. Lizzo cool. sold out. Yeah. yeah, like this isn't like a, this isn't like a West Side Gun conversation. You know what I mean? But like, uh, there was a little bit of like the music, and it was so referential, like all that Ricky Reed stuff to like, the personality. Yes, yeah, so referential and so sonically, like 
I'm deliberately echoing 1977 or whatever it is, um, that anything that you might have liked about 1.0 Lizzo was sort of stripped away. I do feel like the last record like kind of came back a tiny look again freely accept that this is not a popular opinion and i'm not i didn't come on the show today (laughs) to defend that's not why i'm here but i do think it bears i think it's worth saying that i feel like she was on the path herself to untethering her music mm-hmm. from some of this narrative stuff. Yeah. And I don't know if that's because when she looks in the mirror, she realizes that she became uh, a symbol of a this billboard larger, version of herself. Yeah, yeah. Like, or a billboard version of this larger idea about what did we want from pop music yeah. in that time period, especially you mentioned the Trump administration, especially in contrast to the political climate, right? Yeah. At some point, that's a lot of baggage for an artist, yeah. And and someone who I think did not set out 10, 12 years ago doesn't seem like to make those statements. Yeah. Those statements ended up being the ones that made her the biggest and made her the most successful, but I don't necessarily think that was the goal 10 to 12 years ago. And I did feel on the last album a tiny sense of like, how do I kind of like, this is just tied up a hundred different ways. How do I start to untether, untangle this? Well, so maybe this is freeing in some way. Is that what you're saying? Like if Lizzo is now the villain, does that That's free her so. to make music with some friction and some... I'd be very surprised if she did not make music with some friction. And I don't know. I think it was already heading that way. But I mean, we're talking about a degree of like this. Right. But maybe what we're going to get is like a much more scabrous Lizzo persona musically well there was the clip going around you saw of a song where she references being sued uh oh, no. and they were like this lizzo's basically a drill artist like she's going to be prosecuted for her lyrics now <laughs> which is like you know it's a, it's Can't wait. yeah yeah um, uh but there are artists i think we should say that like have the opposite yes problem or which, not a problem but they have the inverse of the lizzo conundrum mm-hmm. which is that they are essentially untouchable because all of the thorns are built in. Or baked in. And this is, I was thinking about this a lot with the Cardi situation. So um, Cardi B was performing at uh, at Drace. Drace? Drace? You like Drace? Yeah. I'm you go there? No, I haven't been. <laughs> Beach Club, one word. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, this is a day party, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> She's performing Bodak Yellow. The check was ginormous. I, I've got it. Based on what she said. Based in, on in 50 the rappers content. Yeah. Sidebar. You got one of these? <laughs> if you want to learn how much I money. Three, I have 300 of these. If you want to learn how much money Cardi B makes for a concert. Yeah. Pick up one of these. Um, can I just say, this is out. You can buy a copy on the New York Times website if you go to the individual page thing. Uh the August individual 6th, page thing. The That's individual the official term, issue yeah. thing. You know it. Just Google it. Uh, the August 6th edition. Um, congratulations. You did great work. You too. Uh, uh, Cardi B speaks about her her day rate uh, for, a, for a beach club party. I, I, yeah, with, I wonder if she this actually newspaper gets section. for a beach club party. I'm going to say probably not. But I think but, a lot of money is uh, safe to say. Yes. So she did not appreciate. She gets doused with water. Right. Uh, Was it definitely me- water? I, I don't I didn't drink it. How would I know that? <laughs> a fan arced arced some clear liquid. Okay. And I guess if I was that fan, would I arc a bunch of vodka? Mm. That, uh, which, like, which at the beach club costs like sixty dollars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was water. Uh arcs it towards Cardi B, lands, it's perfect. It's like literally like yeah. that person should play horseshoes. Yeah. Like it's like a perfect, perfect toss. Direct hit. Um Cardi like stares at her. Why would you do that? And then takes her microphone and uh, who's a who's a famous fastball pitcher right now? <laughs> I would say Nolan Ryan. She, yeah, Nolan Ryan. Yeah, Roger she, Clemens. Yeah, she Garrett Cole's some girl right in the head. 
<laughs> but not the girl who actually allegedly allegedly we don't know. I think it. I think I think it might have ricocheted. I oh. think it, I think it caught them both. Okay, because you saw the follow up footage yes. where the girl is like super apologetic. Yeah. Who, who seemed to throw the liquid. And you can also hear in the background her saying, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, there's video yeah. of her saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. you see her face. Yeah. And then you see her get escorted out in a different video. Anyway, point being, Cardi B is on, there's like, there's a Pruder films, like a hundred different angles of her absolutely rocking that person and maybe an innocent person right. with a microphone. While the vocal track continues in the background. Absolutely fine. Yeah. Uh, shout out to that engineer. Yeah. Really like stayed focused. Yeah. Um, most people support Cardi in this situation, but uh, I will say like Cardi throwing that mic with that ferocity, I was kind of like, that's pretty extra. Right. And she and was investigated by the police. Right. And potentially harming. Yeah. I mean, I'm if she has good aim, great. If she has bad aim, that's bad. Uh, and then was investigated by the police who chose Not to, charge to pursue her. charges. Yeah. But no, almost no one was like, Cardi should not throw the microphone at the random person in the crowd. Now, I, what do you think? I think if it was Lizzo, she would have gotten in trouble for it. This is what I'm saying. Yeah, okay, no, no, no okay. Been, I thought you were going no, the other no, no. direction. People would have been really like, upset if Lizzo did that because Lizzo's fans love her. <laughs> right. And, and why would you abuse your fans? And why would you abuse your fans? No. For, for what could have been a dousing that came out of excitement. Because sometimes you're at a concert. I know I've seen you do this before at a concert. Yes. You're just jumping up and down <laughs> with your $50 <laughs> cup of vodka. It's always happening. And it accidentally goes it ends up flying on towards on Sufjan Cameron. Stevens. Yes. <laughs> or whatever. Cam Ron Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, I think if Lizzo did it, she's going to jail. <laughs> she's going to jail. <laughs> They're going to pick it outside yeah, the Lizzo. Concert. Totally true. Yeah. But with Cardi, and again, Cardi has had um, myriad minor issues with the law. Yeah. In recent years. Yeah. Uh, was it in Queens that she had to go oh, to yeah. court? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. I was there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. But none of that damages the fundamental Cardi B fame proposition, which is here is a person who behaves exactly as they wish to behave. Yeah. Um, and owns it. And, and, and even if it potentially imperils her or other people. So that behavior, throwing the mic, is very much in a pre-existing set of behavior. And when I saw that side by side with the Lizzo thing, the Lizzo thing's an allegation, we don't know if it's true, and it basically kicked the entire foundation out of Lizzo's five years of pop success. Cardi is on camera throwing a microphone at someone and people are kind of like, cool, and the cops are like, love you. we love you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this sort of goes at a more foundational problem, which is that Lizzo is an old version of a celebrity, which is yes. pristine, which mm -hmm. is, you know, perfected in a boardroom, yeah. whether or not it's true or not, but like the, but the presentation of it, the, the sort of, you know, prepackaged, pristine, perfect celebrity. Yeah. And Cardi B comes in saying, what uh, all kinds of reckless things yeah. from her past. This is how I got here. This and, is ha how I'm moving. And frankly, that is my preferred version of celebrity. Well, is Cardi B a better celebrity than Lizzo? Like a hundred like, 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 X. I don't think many people would argue. I hope. I mean, I don't know. Send an email. But it's <laughs> <and NY -times. laughs> if, if you think tell, Lizzo is a better yeah, celebrity than Cardi I'm curious to hear that yeah. argument. I'd yeah. like to hear that argument. But uh, I mean, I guess for, for maybe for, you know, the parent of a young child who would say Lizzo is in fact a good role model and is teaching valuable lessons. You know, I don't know if that maybe exists Cardi anymore. Cardi is a good role model right. by well, saying you don't take any guff. Right. I mean, the, the issue here is should you be taking any cues from any famous person well, ever about no. anything? The answer, no. The yeah. Answer that's that's no. the other thing that only take cues from us. The Lizzo, the Lizzo thing. <laughs> no, the Lizzo thing is like, if you've been around any famous person, yes. you know that at some point they have been really rude to somebody they work with, if not every day. Yeah, of course. Uh, so to, to believe in the fantasy of a teddy bear mm -hmm. that also has millions of dollars is a fool's errand, right? 
So you're saying I should never get millions of dollars. <laughs> That's what you're telling me. Yeah, then you'll no longer be a teddy bear. That's correct. Yeah. Um, I think while we're on the subject of famous people whose public persona can survive anything, really anything, uh, we mentioned Travis Scott earlier. Uh, Travis Scott released Utopia a little while ago. We're going to talk about Utopia, but maybe we should talk about Travis in this context as well. You know, the Astral World Festival a couple of years ago, several people died in stampedes. A lot of the lawsuits, I think you said, have been settled. Already. Yeah, there's some, I think, some, ex- some ongoing civil suits, but the criminal investigation opted not to charge anyone. Um, Travis has managed to come out of this, I don't want to say 100% unscathed, but Travis is basically back to being Travis Scott. It's been a couple of years. He's basically back to normal. He like sold t- half a, almost half a million copies of this album. He's playing in Rome. Playing. Brought Kanye out. Yeah, almost played the pyramids. I think I was as close to playing the pyramids <laughs> as Travis Scott was. Like Popcast Deluxe at the pyramids, as likely as yeah. Travis Scott Utopia at the pyramids. But he basically just waited it out. Yeah. Is that how you saw it? Yeah, I think he waited it out. I mean, obviously it could have gone other directions, but I think once it was clear that there was not going to be any criminal liability, I think he just waited it out. Although he didn't seem to wait it out making new songs. Right. So then he puts out this album, which... If, if it touches on Astroworld at all, it's very, very briefly. Oh, yeah. Where he says in the third person that he would love to save kids, but doesn't say when or where or how. Um, betrays really no demons no. throughout the extent of this album, except demons that were already part of the Travis mystique, which is that he likes drugs and sex. Um and yeah, basically brings no, I, I was going to say new ideas, but maybe just ideas okay, to so the table. I, I, so I have a lot of, I, I, this, is not a, this is not a good album. Uh, let's just, we'll just get it out of the way. It's not a good record. Uh, Travis is a, an artist to me who I struggle even after all this time to try to identify what the value proposition is musically. I understand what it is, big picture, socially, experientially. Even the name of the album, the call it album Utopia, to me, what that says doesn't really say a lot about the music. What it says a lot about is what am I going to call the tour slash festival slash lived in experience that I'm inviting people into? I'm going to call it Utopia, and then I'm going to reverse engineer that into an album. It's like Google's synonym for world. (laughs) Kind of. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, There was also this thing with this album, and No Bells, it's a a website that covers hip-hop, got into this a little bit. A lot of these songs were leaks from early Kanye sessions uh, from many, many years ago. Uh, It seems to be a bit of a piecemeal Frankenstein record. And when you were saying that Travis went away, he didn't go in the lab. It doesn't. And again, like someone's going to send an email and be like, he went in the lab. What he didn't mean? go in the lab. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. thought you, I thought you were telling me. I no, I mean, maybe he lives in the lab. I, I was just like, is this like the most pastiche art possible where you're just like, I'm just gathering all the pieces of my 10 years of, of creative right. output and putting this album together. Or is it like, What's laying around? Right. How do we construct this apart? Yeah. The the Nobel's reporting you're talking about is that they sort of using message boards and fan communities, leakers uh, and leakers, uh, who chart who chart and track this stuff very closely, could say that literally ten or so of the what forty two songs on this (laughs) album um, began as demos from other sessions, specifically Kanye Kanye West albums that and never frankly, came out. I'm sure that a lot of people, that, I'm sure Travis is not the only person to do that. He sure. Might, he might be the most egregious. Right. But he's not the only person right. doing that. Uh, and Travis, of course, has had a role in Kanye albums since Yeezus. Do you and want to play a good Travis solo song from this record, like in the interest of fairness. Yeah, yeah. I actually do think it's interesting, and we can talk about this more, but the idea that, if anything, this is like a buffet of features from the most famous artists in the world. You have The Weeknd, Bad Bunny, Beyonce, Drake, uh, Tizo Touchdown. Tizo Touchdown. (laughs) You know. Dave uh, Chappelle. Dave Chappelle. uh, and, And yet, 
some of the most successful songs on this album are the ones that are just Travis Scott songs? Um, I have a, a thought on this, which is like in the same way that the word utopia exists to describe the physical environment in which you may someday experience Travis Scott related content. Buying a t-shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Seeing other people in Cactus Jack Jordans or whatever. Yeah. Um, that's what utopia is. Mm-hmm. The album. Okay. So the album, the album is the Met Gala. Okay. It's a place for famous people to show up. It's It's a place for famous people to show up and look bad. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> sidebar but it's a place for people to every you know that everybody else who shows up there is going to be famous who all else is coming yeah just it's <laughs> literally first thing, what's the first question you ask who all going to be there uh this is the who all going to be there of albums right and so if you're a super famous person you know other super famous people are going to be there if you are a super famous person you know that the coolest not quite super famous people are also going to be there. Right. And if you are a not quite famous person, you know that you're going to be on an album with some of the biggest names uh, in pop music. That's what this album feels like it exists for. And that's sort of what the last album was like. It's not what two albums ago was like. Like it's like not to be all like there was a golden age of Travis Scott music. Relatively speaking, two albums ago, much to me, it's only sure. Gone down. Birds it's only in gone the Trap, Days Before Rodeo. Like yes. there are Travis Scott yes. songs, albums, projects that sound interesting mm-hmm. and are fun to hear at parties. Yes. And there's some of Astro World that sounds like that. And then there's this. Uh, you What's mentioned a good solo? you mentioned a solo song. I think I know. Yeah, so like, that's one. As I said, like to you before we started taping, mm-hmm. you could have heard this at Kinfolk in 2015. Uh, and it would have, you know, people would have sang the words to it. You would have had fun with your friends. It's, it's a passable song. It's not trying to do anything. There's not seven beat switches. It's uh, just, a, just a Travis Scott my song. My note on that song, accidentally like this. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, is you still love? It's 5 a.m. and I'm drunk right now. Tell me, can we still fuck? one one I'm in the zone right now. Tell me, am I still... Mm, telling you just how I feel right now You say it's just the drugs And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know I also want to talk about God's Country Okay uh, Which I don't love the Travis rapping on But I like the idea It feels very like Rock Marciano type beat Yeah Hot type beat I right. like the idea of like Rock Marciano like just taking this beat And like doing something with it It feels like Travis like stumbled into another parallel universe like he flipped the 50 rappers thing open was like, what does that guy sound like? And then just like, I'm going to make a song on that. Guy. Yeah. And look, there is a lot of Travis, things. We'd love to send you one too, oh, by yeah. the way. Send your address. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of things that sound good on this album, but it is not by any means greater than the sum of its parts. I think the only and constant reference point is Kanye and the way yes. that Kanye. Yes. So, yes. And, and the way that Kanye brings people together, Assembles. get something out of them. Or we should say assembled. Assembled, yeah. Uh, okay, I mean, la- on the last album, Travis had the line on Sicko Mode where he said, I'm the glue. I'm the glue. And on this one, you know what his version of it is? No. I'm human Pinterest. <laughs> Which, like, okay, fine. But I think on a Kanye album... No, no, no. <laughs> you can't move past that no. one? No. <laughs> no, because like I feel like, look, we've all, we're already far enough in to basically be like, if anybody's like a real Travis Scott fan, they're going to be really upset by this yeah, point. Yeah. If you think Tell us how you feel. If you think that someone referring to themselves as human Pinterest is a bar, it's not a bar. Like, it's not a bar. It's not a bar. What it wasn't if, even a bar in 2015. <laughs> what about when he rhymes Chelsea Handler and Kelsey Grammer? On yeah, the actually, first that song? Was, that's Loki. You like that one? That's Loki. <laughs> <laughs> there is one. There's that one song where he's really rapping. The song with West Side Gun. Mm-hmm. It's like an actual rap song. But this but it okay. feels like it's like left over from some other album. But the West Side Gun feature is a is an interesting example because what I was going to say is like when you heard. Bon Iver on Yeezus, or you heard King Louie on Yeezus. You yep. know, when you had mm-hmm. an unlikely feature 
sort of come in from nowhere and crash into a Kanye album. You know, go. You could go way back. You could go mm-hmm. to Paul Wall. Uh, you know, on late registration, whatever. Like, pick it. Pick an example. Yeah, sure. Like, you were jolted, and you were getting a version of that artist that you'd never heard in their n- yeah. in their natural habitat. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the juxtaposition was, you know, uh, made you unsteady in some way or you, yeah, you just found a different side of that person. And also, but they were treated respectfully for their particular version of musicality. That is not what Kanye does, but Kanye appreciates. And on the Travis Scott album, like it just feels perfunctory, right? Like there's like the K-pop record, which, um, I mean, right, a song called K-pop. Literally, a song called K-pop by three of the most famous people on the planet, two of whom are involved with the Jenners. Oh, okay. Right? Sure. Bad Bunny and Kendall. Yeah. Travis and Kylie. Yeah. Not making that up. Okay. Yeah. I it's mean, factual. TMZ knows. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're, not, no, we're not breaking news here. Um, uh, calling a song K-pop. Calling a song K-pop is like calling an album Utopia. Mm. It's evoking an idea it's not connected. The song has nothing to do it's with SEO K-pop. core. It's all it is. And yeah. it's literally it. I bet it comes from sitting around and being like, what's the biggest thing? Like, what's the biggest thing that's happening? What's the thing that frankly most existentially threatens our primacy? Utopia. <laughs> yeah. It's K pop. Yeah. What if we made a song and we called it K pop yeah. and then like reverse engineered everything from there? I don't even necessarily dislike like, I think the weekend sounds fine on this. Like I don't necessarily even hate it. It's just it's so empty. It has no foundations, no concrete in this record at all. It's like all like cotton candy. It just falls apart. And the West Side Gun verse that I was speaking of, Sorry, I yeah. do think no no, is is a is an example of the opposite where when West Side Gun comes on comes on this album like 70% of the way through yep. sort of like high pitch wheezing like doing mm-hmm. the west side gun thing yeah, like having a personality you're like awakened from of the slumber the of the hour and 14 minutes uh of this album and there are a few moments here where that happens and I want to hear more about yeah. the bits you like because we should go out uh and speaking about Travis Scott on a little bit of a positive note um but uh, okay. The the last thing I want to say about the features and the way that features work on this album is just to do a little bit of a behind the scenes thing. Like you've been in the studio with musicians and you've been in the studio with rappers yes. and you've heard rappers play their own music in the studio. Yep. Uh, imagine a late night with Travis Scott and three to five of the other most famous people in the world. Like, uh, Travis Scott could probably get some of these people in the same room at the same time. Actually, yeah, yeah these are not emailed. That versions. doesn't happen all the time, but yeah, like, yeah. It, like Drake mailed his verse in. We know that because it didn't make the vinyl. Yes. But like a couple of these people, I think, like were probably in the room at the same time. You know, friends are there. People are taking pictures. You're posting a lot on Instagram, or you're saving Instagram posts for later. Sound like Styles P in the Fifty Rappers. Yeah, uh, and then. And you, everyone does their verse, and everyone's so high on everybody else. Yeah, of course. And then you play the song on the best speakers that have ever existed. Sounds great. Or you're in a car that costs more than all of our lives put together, yeah, sure. uh, and you're riding around, you know, Rodeo Drive, and you're blasting the song you just made with The Weeknd and Bad Bunny or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm making this up, but like that's what this album is to me. It's a bunch of songs that sounded good. In the, in the best moment. possible moment right, but scenario. No actual, yeah. But then you wake up the next morning and you play it, you know, in your headphones and you're, you're like, like yeah, <laughs> exactly. Die. Like that to me is Travis Scott's like career in a nutshell. Uh, but I'm wondering, yeah, are there moments on this album that work for you? Like what are, what's, what are your favorite features on Utopia? Because to me, I think like we said, okay, Travis Scott, a f- couple good solo songs that are passable radio or club filler but like are, are there mo- are there moments that you yeah. want to hear on this album again i like the thug verse okay schizo okay Should i like to listen to a little bit of that yeah for sure bling bling i get a rest every time i see some diamond she get it up she gonna bounce it like a trampoline 21 savage is on this record twice yeah i really like the second one which is the last song which has james blake First of all, free my guy James Blake. But it's froze. I don't think you can have Boney Bear and James Blake. Yeah, no. Pick one. That's what I'm saying. Like, free my guy, James Blake. Go back to doing the other thing. Whatever the other thing was, that was blessed. 
Like this, this, we don't need this. Like, do you think that this is paying for James Blake's grandchildren's grandchildren's university fees? One can only hope. I mean, obviously. Get I like that you said university fees. <laughs> yeah, because he's British. <laughs> I know. Yes. Get your bag. <laughs> we, we support the bag getting, but like that. Mm. The second 21 Savage verse, uh, the song is Till Further Notice. Uh, long I like song. It, long song. Very long. But I like that. I like 21 Savage's mode of like, uh, I'm actually uh, wounded. Yeah, he's people. apologizing. Yeah, yeah, Sort yeah. of, almost. It's halfway. Yeah. But I, I like that version. Yeah. Which, I mean, I like the other one too, but like this is it's like particularly pointed. Um, the Rob 49 verse, yeah. which is on the other 21 Savage song. Right, songs, uh, like Topia, Topia Twins, Twins. Yeah. which... Rob the, 49. The, the, We're going to return to Rob 49 in a minute, actually. The idea behind Topia Twins, if, if if you can say that there is one, like what the song is about mm. is that if... You, a woman is annoying. You have to find a beach. <laughs> is that what it's about? And then that that makes makes her less annoying. I don't really know. Like, I don't know. <laughs> there's not a lot of detail there, but uh, that's so. that's the chorus of Topia Twins. And then the Drake parts of the Drake verse, uh, the part where he's like, "I melted down your boss's chains." Uh, and also, uh, I felt like an implicit counterpoint to the piece that I wrote about Drake being a huge fan. Drake saying, I don't give a fuck about all that heritage. Yeah. And I'm going to melt down your chain. As he said, he's teed off. He's doing like the little whisper. Yeah. And he's like, I'm, he's really, really angry. Do you think he really melted the chains down? Do I think he a melted Pharrell's chains? That's like chains. looting antiquities. It's like, like, are we allowed to do that? Like, should there not be a historical preservation committee that says you cannot buy the Pharrell and ERD chain and melt it down? Like, there should be a law. Like, is it is it a threat or is it or is it a promise? It sounded like he did it. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think the percentage chance that he did it is? Uh, I don't think he did it. I don't think he did it. If he did it, then he's going to remix it and debut a, a chain that is, in fact, a comment on the original chain. Fine. He's also out here wearing Pox Ring at Starlets on Side Talk. Yeah. A little Pox shirt today in yeah. honor of the Pox. Yeah. Um, Drake is in his collector's era. The ICP jersey. Was that an eBay find or what? First of all, as someone that has a psychopathic jersey uh, eBay alert and has had one for many, many, Drake's many just years. Buying them up. He's literally he's ruining the prices. He's screwing the curve up. Um, yeah, he's in his collector's era. Whom's gonna relate? Uh, obviously, that's great. Uh, but I, that I liked that part of that verse. Is, I like the, the yeah. pacing of the rhyme in that verse. Yeah. Um, uh, what about you? Playboy Cardi. Yes. Playboy Cardi uh, on Fiend. Mm -hmm. Uh unrecognizable to the point where nobody was sure it was it Playboy was Cardi yeah. until they confirmed it was Playboy Cardi. Mm -hmm. Also, Travis did the thing where all the features are invisible when the album comes out and yeah. they're like surprises. And then, which I do like a couple of days later, they like updated it and just put them in the track I thing. I, again, I SEO like core. It's like for the history. I know. We need features listed. Just, right, just like it. But I'm glad they ended up there. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Playboy Cardi debuting a whole new voice yes play Ricardi, a man of many 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 voices um and many voices that have been imitated and taken on by other people now he sounds like a combination of future and little baby but like but like high on crate yeah crazy high off the splendor um i and i think he comments on how many flows he has uh in the verse So speaking of Playboy Cardi, we have a question of the week. It's about Playboy Cardi mm -hmm. and related phenomena, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is from Ned Hardy. Do you think that's Ed, like a play on Ed Hardy? Is that your real name? Uh, Ned Hardy says, hello from a longtime listener, first time emailer. At the risk of sounding like a V-Lone tween, V-Lone tween's on that endless right now, on that Hellstar, right? On that spider. Like, first of all, I'm a... I'm gonna pop out in some Hellstar very soon. Velon Tween is on Utopia Deluxe. <laughs> Velon Tween's on Pop yeah. Popcast Deluxe, Utopia Deluxe, Playboy Cardi Deluxe. Thoughts on Playboy Cardi? Question mark. 
feels pretty notable that he exited the pandemic as a top build festival headliner for two years running. We'll return to that. Is about to play MSG on a global arena tour and appears to be the most popular non-Drake rapper in the world, according to Instagram Explore page, <laughs> all while dropping just one album with basically zero radio play in the last half decade. Um, is Playboy Cardi Adele? I was going to say Playboy Cardi's The Grateful Dead, but we'll come to it. Is he on the rap version of a Lana trajectory with basically no ch- Playboy Cardi at the Newport Folk Festival? <laughs> yeah, some of y'all would like to see that. We don't support that. Um, with basically no chart hits, but a big career supported by critical acclaim, constant leaks, and a very devoted fan base. If so, what's next? Destroy Lonely just made a song with Pink Pantheris. Is Opium the next big thing in pop? Or fashion. Cardi's label. Yes. Is Ken Carson goaded? No. It, <laughs> yeah. Eager for any insight you can uh, any insight you can offer. Um, can we start with the festival question? Mm. Because I was thinking a lot about festivals when I was writing about the throwing things and the stage thing. And I think if you roll back to the rolling loud where Uzi climbed up onto the tower, whatever yep. that was, like a sound tower or yep. something, and stage dived off of that, like from 70 feet up. Yeah. I remember, like, obviously, at those early SoundCloud shows being like, damn, we're really moshing again. Like, kids are really wilding. And then seeing the earliest Rolling Loud festival um, footage where I was like, that barrier is 100% gone. Playboy Cardi feels like an optimal type of artist for that kind of crowd who are looking for energy, contextless, you know, the rage, whatever. Cardi is really optimal. Does he need to release music? If anything, releasing more music runs the risk of him seeming out of step. And mm, I was thinking, one thing I wanted to mention about Travis, and I think this probably also loosely goes for Cardi, although Travis, you can make out the words more than you can with Cardi. I really was trying to, on Utopia, I was trying to listen to what he was saying. I missed the Pinterest line. But I was trying to listen to what he was saying, right? And because of his kind of clipped rapping style, he's obviously and often just throwing catchphrases against each other or proper nouns against each other. And I think for a casual hip-hop listener, of which there are millions and millions and millions, That's a real interesting entry point to be like, this person's high energy. He's rapping words that seem cool. They're like cool phrases. If you are just showing up to the party and you need something that's a a gateway artist, Travis Scott might be the ultimate gateway artist. And that's why maybe people, and I don't even think this is a generational thing, but people were just like a little bit more musically knowledgeable or like mm, this is pretty brittle but i think it's it. crucial that a lot of their fans are young for that's both what i'm saying yes yeah. it, it can be generational also yes although i think it's possible to be a younger person who's like very knowledgeable sure. about music we of honor course. we honor those people yeah please come in turn <laughs> 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 um but i was thinking of that when i was listening to travis and i do think cardi functions similarly just without the burden of actually having to know what the hell the words are but i do think that Cardi even more so than Travis in part because of uh, where where Travis is corporatized uh, Nikes and McDonald's and this and that and merch all the time Cardi is dedicated to at least seeming underground and seeming uh, yeah you know subversive and anti interview and anti media you saw and- he gave his uh one of the first interviews he's given a long time to the outfit guy backstage or whatever that festival was. And he kept saying all this stuff was one of one and priceless. Although in fact, then then all the accounts that say, actually it's just like some like motorcycle brand. Yeah. But he's, Uh, he's, he looked, but I will say he looked great. He looked great. I genuinely, I was like looking at him. I was like, you look healthy and charged and like ready to go. Look, I hope that's true. I mean, going back to the earlier conversation about who is Teflon and who is not, Playboy Cardi has been accused of violence. Uh, You know, he's potentially facing criminal charges uh, in various scenarios. And because of the way he's been able to sort of float under the mainstream, he's not really in for any real 
criticism or comeuppance. Correct. Um, and he's been able to stretch his sort of outlaw image to its extreme, 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 more than Travis, more than Uzi, more than Rocky, like more than all the people he sort of learned from. Do you feel that out of that particular cohort, he is the most signature stylist? I do. I yeah. also think that, I also he, think that too. he is a true experimentalist. He was experimenting with genre. You know, I think like as much as we give yeah. Uzi credit for that, like Cardi is the yeah. blueprint uh, Whole, most like, immediately. Like I have days where I think Whole Lot of Red is like a two out of ten, and I have days where I think Whole Lot of Red is like a twenty out of ten. Yeah, and really, same really for really Dilit and and the and the ones before that. Like mm -hmm. every like Playboy Cardi is trying things, and I think that's what you hear in his in his voice uh, on the Travis Scott album. Um, he he seems to be. An, a true innovator. Um, and I think that that's what keeps like un, un, he's like, un, he's an innovator in part because he's unburdened from having to make radio records from having to like compromise really in any of those other ways. And some of these other artists uh, who have their eye on a different prize allow themselves, you know? Yeah. And I do think that it's not wrong, Ned, uh, especially in, in the way that we've talked about it over the years to put that in the sort of late Lana mold, you know, basically only making music for your fans, which is huge, which is huge base. Um, and also not even necessarily needing to release those songs for them, for them to power your career. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we'll continue to see Cardi doing some version of that, both because he's, allergic to being tamed and because it's actually good for business a little bit of a rough pivot but um on regular podcasts this week we talked about Sinead o'connor uh amanda hess came through alfred sardo came through um we lost Sinead. we lost angus cloud to you know obviously two very different situations but i i did feel like Sinead's passing it was very very heartening to see celebrations of music and celebrations of the way that she related to her public self. Um, Sinead is someone, uh, we certainly have talked about how people get uh, mishandled or rinsed by the media. Uh, and certainly in the case of people like Britney, you know, there's these come up uh, reckonings that happen many years later. I think that with Sinead actually went through maybe a couple of cycles of that. Um, Most recently with the release of her memoir uh -huh. and her press tour and the piece that Amanda has Amanda. did for the paper. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, like, I wrote a little bit about the SNL performance because I wanted to actually honor the performance. Uh, I actually got an email to the podcast email saying that the way that she sang war was very much in keeping with chanting in Catholic school, like how students are taught to to read the Bible or, or recite the Bible, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Um, I don't know. As a non-Catholic, I don't know. Um, but I found in general the way that people spoke about Sinead in the wake of her passing to be very heartening. And that's not something I often feel. I, I, I sometimes feel that not that, the, not that people talk about not that people are contesting people in their death, but um, it can be almost too saccharine, too hagiographical. Uh, I feel like Sinead was spoken about as a person in the wake of her passing. Because her complexity and was just on you on could not street. you yeah. couldn't ignore it. Um, yeah. but it was so it was so I feel like you can breathe a little bit because you wanna when someone passes away, it's like you want to engage with their humanity. And I felt like people really stepped up and did that. Though I do fear that we're in for the sort of flattening of the we're so sorry Sinead oh, of course. media cycle, whether it's you know, whatever content comes out of this tragic moment mm -hmm. uh, in a in a culture media sense, like I do worry that it's going to go too far in that flattening direction with her. Um, but I think you're right. I think she, both in her music and in her writing and in her public persona, you know, yep. you saw a lot of people sharing comments she'd left on the New York Times story, uh -huh. uh, emails she'd sent, yeah. uh, Twitter posts she'd made. Almost every journalist who had interviewed her shared some behind the scenes about their uh, interactions with her outside of the story or like in the non-public parts of the story, which 
you know, happens from time to time and we don't always talk about, but does happen from time to time. And she, yeah, I feel like she sort of made all of that part of the mix before anyone could like sand down her her edges. Yeah, sure. You know, um, you've been listening to Sinead music since, like. Yeah, I was really. I, I saw that you had posted Black Boys on mopeds on your story. That's to me obviously one of the the signature Sinead yeah. records. Yeah. You know, Sinead is someone you know obviously not American, uh, but first of all engaged with black American culture, you know, getting MC light on a record very, very, very early before shouted out by uncle Luke again in yeah. these interviews that we did. Um, and you know, Sinead understanding the struggle of the black community in Ireland and in England, um, and, and bringing that into her music, which, you know, in 2023, people aren't doing that. Uh, and she was doing it in 1989. Well, people should do it if they can you know what i mean like she has the sort of she she had she She had the gravitas and the the talent to to pull it off um the other tragic passing you mentioned angus cloud um best known as fezco from euphoria um and i felt like people again like it wasn't you don't have to connect the two but there was a sort of bareness uh to their performance uh in the world yeah and a sort of open pain right like angus was very clear throughout his short life and short career that he was always going through something that he had never really achieved the you know the peace that one might think comes with being on a hit hbo show no and 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 you know you know he was i don't think he was intending to be an you know it's all sort of yeah he was plucked off the street yeah landed very heavily and and you know uh, it was a hard thing to cope with uh, I, I was really reminded, it, and again, the, the power of the Bay Area here, uh, you know, Guap Dad 4000 was talking about his relationship with Angus, and not that this is the Bay, but Southern California, but 03 Greedo, like, uh, to see the degree to which he was embraced by the hip-hop community, and, and, and vice versa, um, a hero. Yeah. Uh, and, like, a folk hero, almost. And a great actor. I mean, you know, a standout of Euphoria season one, yeah. centered in season two. I think you know if you if you don't know Angus's performances, the premiere of season two, um, which does his backstory with his his grandmother mm-hmm. um, and and how he came to be brothers with the character yeah. Ashtray, mm-hmm. you know, and that's the that becomes the backbone for the whole season. And I think yeah, Euphoria is not Euphoria without Fez and without the the sort of budding romance that he he got to he got yeah. to play out um in season two and yeah i just don't know i don't know where they go from there without him and also i, I will say that like the distress in the fez character was fe- it it felt very raw yeah so there, there was a true yeah. rawness and that distress spilled over into angus's public life and public performances you know red carpet interviews that kind of went in uncomfortable directions have you ever seen his episode of sneaker shopping? I have not. His episode of sneaker shopping is is quite something. Uh, it's all over the place, real blurry line between character and non-character. But with that, it, watching, actually watching season two, having seen some of the stuff in public, like the, it, I found it a little bit tough to watch some mm-hmm. of season two. I didn't watch it in real time. I watched. I came to it later, but I found it a little bit tough to watch kind of having seen some of the things that were going on in public. And that was really, really tough. And again, not to link the two people, but these are folks who were playing out inner struggle on very public stages and were sometimes celebrated and sometimes pilloried for that. Should we play a couple songs to yeah. go out on to a... To leaven the mood? Yeah, higher note. I think you should go first. Yours is more leavening okay. than mine. I've got a um, new song called Trust Fall okay. by Cowgirl Clue. Mm. Cowgirl Clue, an artist I heard about maybe late last year um, from a song called Trailblazer. Um, And she's doing a little bit of a 
future pop Y2K thing, but with Southern influence, with country influences. Mm -hmm. So you'll have little guitar licks over break beats or, you know. Uh, we're back to back. We were back to back with first with the Buckle Bunny. and uh, Yeah, I mean, it's not yeah. Buckle Bunny, but yeah. it's it, but it is. A, and for the record, I know what Buckle Bunny means. <laughs> just for the you just record. didn't want to say it playful. on the podcast. I know what it means. You just didn't want to. You just didn't want to own it That's on record. Cowgirl Clue put out an album last week called Rodeo Star. Uh, good name. <laughs> Yeehaw. Um, and yeah, it's just a, it's a sound that makes so much sense that yeah. you wonder how somebody no didn't get to before. it first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, listen, we'll listen to a little bit of Trust Fall. We've somehow not talked about La Tyler. Yeah. Um, Florida legend. Uh, at age of like nine. You yeah. know. How many times did I suggest Lil Tyler as, as a, 50 a 50 rapper? Yeah, it was, it came, it was on the list. <laughs> he came the, up. Came up. It was on the list. Um, and so this is uh, an opportunity to talk about a new La Tyler song, but, but also just the big picture. Um, 16 years old? 15 or 16? Certainly a teenager. Very young incredibly nimble rapper yeah like so good with syllables yeah uh such a casual affect in the rhyme delivery mm -hmm. um saying some absolutely wild stuff but in the most kind of like afterthoughty way yeah like really really like a great great listen so there's a new song this week uh it's a feature with be love it's called gang gang uh it's a really good la Tyler verse like we should listen to that but Mostly, well, let's listen to it and then I'll we'll point afterwards. So, really, the thing that got me like, I feel like I went through like two phases with him now. I'm like in my second phase. The thing that kind of like got me in was a tweet that was. Uh, reposting someone who had posted his double XL freshman freestyle outtake. Right. Not the not, not the, the published freestyle. Not the freestyle and not the cipher. Right. So there's a lot of double XL content. Shout out Vanessa. A lot of double XL content. So this is an outtake. And if you we're not gonna play it, this is very bleeped, it'd be all bleeped. But like if you ever wanted to hear someone say rhyme, my mama there and Obamacare, this is the verse for you go in um i for one am very hungry sweet or savory i think sweet let's talk about leavening oh all right we got a limited edition snack i like that. this uh, this one i pulled from type exclusive from the 7-elevens of los angeles oh okay harder to find in new york so far okay this is a churro flavored kit kat all right. I saw Leslie's eyes twinkle behind the scenes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Churro flavor kick. Yeah, great. Uh, looking forward to this one, I have to say. I, Do you do a lot of alt-flavored Kit Kats? You mean like the Japanese limited ones? Yeah, or like, like the some, green teas, the go-to. Yeah, like I have a melon one that I got at one of like the exotics gas stations over on the west side um, that I've been sort of working my way through, like a big sack of them. Uh, yeah, I'll try them. Tea doesn't really do anything for me. I love the color. This is a great this. color. Yeah, beautiful. Um, it's like a, well, you're the fashion writer. How would you describe this color? Spotted wheat. <laughs> okay. Was, like yeah, if this was some, like an Air Force One. It'd be yeah, like spotted, spotted wheat. wheat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it has some, has some um, freckles it on really the It really does smell correct. Yeah. It's like a little cinnamony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. smells correct. Uh -huh. Mm. Smells better than it tastes. It's much creamier than I expected it to be. Oh, well, then the cream. Okay, actually, I spoke too soon. Because then the cream hit. Less punchy with the cinnamon and more creamy yeah. with the caramel. Okay. I love it. Okay. I'm going to have to give this two separate scores. Wow. The coating, the external score, I'm going four. Wow. It's just not doing it for me. It tastes plastic. Again, it, it feels 
the thickness of it is disproportionate to the taste flavor. You just don't like Kit Kats. No, I love Kit Kats. Okay. But what I really like is the cream in a Kit Kat. You know what I do is I love bite off all the chocolate. Oh, you save the wafer? Split the wafers out. Serial killer behavior. <laughs> Not no. Uh, but then when the cream hit on this, cream's a nine. You like the wafer and whatever's connecting the wafer. That's a nine. The exterior is a four. Smells good too, but like the exterior. So we're know. averaging out at a right. at a six and a half. Six, um, six, yeah, six and a half. <laughs> um, I, is is it possible? I just love every snack. Yeah, except the grimace shake. <laughs> Truly, you're the reporter and I'm the critic. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, I'm, I'm I'm a fan. That's what I am. I'm a fan of music and I'm a fan of snacks, and I also report on them sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but I love this. This is. I think this. I would say this is as good as a regular Kit Kat, which is like a 9.5. No, that's crazy, doll. It's nowhere near as good as a regular Kit Kat. I love it. No, absolute bonkers. You like the birthday cake Kit Kat too? No. Oh, just so, this. Okay. You're allowed to have your own feelings and independent thoughts. I'm going to eat a whole. I'm glad I bought more than one because I'm going to eat the rest. And you can have it all to yourself because I don't want it. Um, that's our show. Um, every podcast ever is at nytimes.com slash podcast. Podcast Deluxe is on youtube.com slash nytimes. Um, you can get Podcast Deluxe in video on YouTube. You get it in audio with the rest of the audio feed. Uh, that's on Apple, Spotify, also on YouTube on the podcast on the NY Times podcast page. Um, it's the podcast on myshopify.com for the stickers, the t-shirts. If you want to wear it to a tour, be spotted by somebody else who likes podcasts who then emails us or DMs us uh, and tells us about it. That could happen. Um, what else? Email us at podcastnytimes.com. Get in the Discord. We need some questions. Get in the Facebook group, tinyurl.com slash podcast Facebook or podcast slash podcast Discord. Thank you, as always, to Karen Gans and Pedro Rosado. This episode is produced by Sawyer Roquet with help from Jamie Heffitz. Our executive producer, of course, it's Leslie Davis. This week, audio engineering is by Brad Fisher. Of course, thank you to Nell Galogli. Thank you to Aaron Bird. Thank you to the video team. We're out. We're back next week.